I, uh, I want to thank you for coming. I know it's very cold out there, and uh, the topic is not that interesting at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when, where was the, uh, when I finished my PhD, I went to uh, a talk at Iowa State. My dissertation was on uh, and volume in turkeys. And uh, the lady who invited me, <laughs> my postdoc mentor, she said, you know, uh, we're going to schedule your talk for 3 o'clock. Because sex talks are always very interesting in the afternoon. No one sleeps. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Barry, I'm not nervous. No one's going to sleep. Okay, you'll be okay. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have Barry here. He's actually my mentor. And I, uh, I wanted him to call because the position he holds at Rogers, I want us to establish that tech. That's my secret. <laughs> so uh, he's a... Uh, a distinguished service professor, and he's been there since 1966. Most of you are not even an atom yet. <laughs> so, so, uh, and, and he looks so strong, stronger than uh, that, so, uh, Devin and I do. So, <laughs> and we do all that prowl all the time. So, uh, yeah, so, 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 uh, and I think Barry is very happy to be anywhere today, given what is happening in his neighborhood up in New Jersey. Um, he, uh, he was born in, in the Bronx, and he has stories to tell about that, I think. But I have one story to tell about him being from the Bronx. He hung out outside Yankee Stadium, and one day he saw Mickey Mandel come in. Mickey, Mickey, Mickey. And then Ricky pushed a very famous man. <laughs> so, so, so it turned out that Mickey was wrong. He pushed away a very famous man that we are having here today. Okay, so uh, uh, it's, it, I think it's always exciting to have somebody come in and speak about something that's so passionate to them. And uh, as a neuroscientist, I think Barry has shown that he can environmental biology and behavior, psychology and behavior, and I think he has been at the forefront of that merger. So it's a real pleasure to have him here to speak to the history of it. There's a, um, there's a fun fact about him that I'm going to tell. When I was searching about him on the internet, I went to, it led me to the Huffington Post. And so last two weeks, there was a major scientific report about whether size matters. And the person they went to for that scientific input a little bit was I said, yeah, it's good to have her here. <laughs> the person who was, you know, who uh, who is the leader in that area. So uh, Barry actually got his degree from uh, uh, City University of New York. I was a uh, visitor there myself some time ago for NIH, and then went to Rutgers to get his PhD and his postdoc at UCLA. And then uh, in 66, 66, he returned to Rogers, where he had been since then. Uh, since being at Rogers, he's been an associate dean. He's been everything. And the thing that I like the most is that he has been IMSD director since 1984. And that's very dear to us who invited him here. And his program is a little better than ours, but I think we're going to learn from you. All right, Barry? Go ahead. So please let's give him a walk. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, escaping from uh, Newark with the uh, no electricity anywhere and uh, the disaster in New Jersey. It really is a terrible, a terrible situation. But uh, um, so. Uh, uh, thank you, Ed, and thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the research that I've done, and uh, give you, uh, you know, I'm not going to start from what we're doing right now because I think it, it's uh, instructive to know how we got, how I got to to where uh, to to this study of uh, uh, sexual response in humans, and um, so the the. Um, uh, 
really the way the way I got started in this field was that um, uh, I uh, uh, was interested at the time in um, in uh, neuroendocrinology uh, when I was a graduate student. It was a hot hot area, and it was uh, just people were beginning to understand uh, questioning how does how do, um, how does the nervous system control the endocrine system? Where where does that uh, transduction occur? And um, uh, so uh, for my doctorate, I, I um, studied uh, put crystals of hormone in the uh, in the brain of ring doves and uh, stimulated their reproductive behavior. And I wanted to know what are the neurons, what do the hormones do to the brain to uh, to the neurons to stimulate the behavior? And uh, uh, the only person doing that, uh, studying that, was uh, Tom Sawyer, uh, Charles Sawyer at UCLA, and um, uh, he was studying uh, effects of hormones on uh, neural activity. And so I went there. Uh, I, I did my postdoc there, as I said. And uh, <clears throat> this was the and the paradigm that they were working on was uh, the uh, the pseudo pregnancy uh, endocrine reflex that was uh, uh, discovered by uh, Morgan Evans in uh, the 1920s. And what they showed was that uh, if there's a sterile mating, uh, the, uh, the stimulation of the uh, reproductive tract uh, releases the hormones of pregnancy uh, from the pituitary, and uh, it uh, uh, stimulates the development of the uterus to prepare the uterus for uh, uh, the placenta uh, and for, for a pregnancy. Uh, so the, uh, and the transduction occurs at the, uh, between the brain and the pituitary. I'm not going to go into that, but that's the what we were studying. That's what Sawyer was studying, and we were looking at brain activity in response to uh, vaginal stimulation, artificial uh, vaginal stimulation with a with a glass rod, because it's not only sterilizing through that, but also just artificially stimulating, doing the vaginal stimulation, uh, uh, releases the hormones of, of pregnancy, and the rats become uh, pseudo pregnant. They go through the the hormonal changes of pregnancy, but they're not pregnant. Um, so. Uh, then, when I got back to Rutgers after my postdoc, um, uh, Tom, um, Cho, um, James Olds, uh, who was, his claim to fame was uh, uh, identifying a, a so-called pleasure center in the brain, where uh, at rats, if you give a electrical stimulation to the brain, rats would um, press the lever, and they would press the lever preferentially to eating. So they would uh, be pressing the lever to get the, the electrical stimulation of the brain, and they'd starve to death. And uh, he was then studying reward and reinforcement, and he and he asked me to come and look at his rats. They had a lot of rats with uh, the new technology of, of being of being able to record the activity of single neurons in awake animals. And he was studying them during uh, in Skinner boxes and boxes automatically uh, uh, teaching them, uh, giving them reward. And he wanted to be able to look at the behavior. So I sat there looking at the behavior and listening to their neural activity, the activity of the neurons. And I tried all different kinds of stimulation to see what would happen to try to correlate the neural activity with the, with the behavior. And uh, uh, one of the things I tried was, uh, was vaginal stimulation because uh, that's, that's uh, one of the strong, that I knew that that had a strong effect on neural activity in the brain from, from uh, uh, so working with Sawyer. Uh, but these were awake animals and, and they, the rats we used at UCLA were anesthetized. So now I, I was looking at awake rats recording their brain activity and doing the vaginal stimulation and I found something very very surprising, very strange. Uh, uh, this is, uh, let me, uh, let me see, I have to uh, go, let's see, I think I do it this way. And so, uh, Pitching the foot, the, the rat showed a normal withdrawal reflex. And then I tried vaginal stimulation, a mild stimulation, about 50 grams, pushing against the cervix. And notice that the rat becomes immobilized. And then if I pinch, if I pinch the foot, no response at all. No mobilization squeak that normally occurs, and, and no response. Uh, I tried the standard uh, pain, uh, pain uh, measuring test of uh, hot light on the tail, and uh, rats show a, a withdrawal. They flip the tail away in about two seconds, just like we would if our finger was under the light. And then during the vaginal stimulation now, there's no response at all. Completely blocks the response. So a very powerful uh, blockage. And, um, Uh, 
<clears throat> so the question is, um, it looks like it looks like it's uh, it's, it's blocking the uh, the responses to painful stimulation, but is it blocking pain, or is it just immobilizing the rats? And what what about the normal situation of normal mating? Uh, we tried this uh, this uh, experiment where we uh, gave a shock to the tail of the rat and to, to the female and give it get a vocalization, and uh, each time uh, that she vocalized, uh, then we looked at the natural mating. Uh, so before copulation. Uh, we got vocalizations about uh, almost 100% of the time, and then when the when the males mounted and uh, had an intermission, uh, penile insertion to the vagina, then there was a marked reduction in the number of vocalizations to the tail shock, and then when the male ejaculated, the female didn't vocalize at all. Uh, this is a very powerful effect, uh, uh, and to see how to calibrate it, uh, I, I gave different doses of morphine. And found here's the uh, the the, ab, the typical uh, analgesic uh, dose of morphine in rats and in humans is four milligrams per kilogram. So at 15 milligrams, four times almost four times that dose, uh, the the uh, we're still getting uh, about the same as uh, the same degree of analgesia or, or uh, blockage of response to pain as in normal intermissions. But even uh, three or four times the dose was not. Uh, as strong as the inhibitory effect that ejaculation has on the female, so it's it's a uh, it's a natural a natural condition where the, the female rats are willing to take the uh, uh, their well uh, I should say that there's a, there is an aversive effect of a repeated mating, but uh, that's also necessary for them to become pregnant. It's not simply the ejaculation that's necessary. They have to have repeated intermissions before they get the ejaculation in order to release enough hormones to become pregnant. And uh, but those intermissions are aversive; they become aversive. So I think that the, this uh, pain blocking mechanism makes the female rats willing to accept the necessary intermissions before, uh, in order to become pregnant. So that allows them to become pregnant. Uh, so, uh, but the question was: Is this uh, are we blocking their ability to move? or to respond to pain, or are we blocking the, the actual pain sensitivity? Um, and um, so here, this is a single neuron recording in, um, in the thalamus, uh, a single neuron uh, that fires in response to just touching the forepaw, and also fires in response to crunch, uh, scratching the cornea. This is, uh, uh, the rats were uh, anesthetized in this experiment. And uh, to applying vaginal or cervical stimulation did not have any effect on the touch, uh, but it, it strongly inhibited the response to scratching the cornea. So in other words, a tactile stimulus, a, a, a gentle stimulus, was not being inhibited by the, by the vaginal stimulation, but um, a powerful stimulus uh, was being inhibited. Uh, so, and that's a selective inhibition of response to pain, uh, apparently, uh, and uh, that's called analgesia, not anesthesia. Anesthesia would be a, a total block of, of all kinds of responses to noxious and innocuous stimulation. Uh, but uh, really, uh, I think the most scientific way of asking, of, of getting an answer, uh, would be to um, ask women what, what happens uh, to vaginal stimulation when they, when they receive vaginal cell stimulation. So um, I uh, negotiated, I recruited uh, Beverly Whipple, who had just uh, published the, uh, the book, The G-Spot. Uh, she said that uh, I invited her to give a, a talk at my human sexuality course, and uh, she came and uh, uh, she said that uh, she was she's a nurse. Uh, she wanted to get a PhD, so I said let's do this project. So I convinced her, and then she became my PhD student. And we did this study uh, in women. Uh, this is uh, I, I devised this uh, this device that had a, a force transducer in the neck, and uh, so they could uh, press against the, uh, the cervix. Uh, I, I fitted a diaphragm with uh, Velcro. Uh, so this, this is a, a, just a, a tampon mounted on a loose side tube and it inserted into the uh, force transducer handle. And so the women could press against the cervix. Uh, the the uh, diaphragm would protect the cervix and also keep the, keep the stimulator centered on the cervix. And uh, alternatively, they could hold onto the handle and twist it forward and this would press uh, the, uh, the cotton tip from the tampon against the anterior vaginal wall. This is the region of the, of the G spot. Uh, so they could do vaginal self stimulation or cervical self stimulation. And uh, then we, uh, uh, this is, we measured the force that they were using. And 
then uh, this is a device, a simple device. Uh, it's a motor with a, a weight uh, move that uh, there's a worm gear that moves out across the arm, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, there's a, a plinth here that's about the one millimeter diameter, and this pushes down, and we can uh, measure the force uh, exerted. Uh, we ask the women to say, uh, tell me when it hurts. Uh, and uh, so here's a close-up of that. They put the finger here, and this presses down on it. And then we also have, um, to measure the, the touch thresholds, this is a, these are called von Fry fibers. This is a nylon filament that uh, presses on the skin. And we, this is a graded series of 25 different uh, nylon monofilaments of different graded uh, uh, force to bend it. Uh, so, and they calibrate in terms of the force to just bend it. So we get touch thresholds. And uh, so uh, doing the experiment, what we found was that when the women uh, apply vaginal self-stimulation, we get an increase in the force, that it, an increase of over 40% in how much force it takes before they say it hurts. And um, if that continues just uh, just, the, the, just the vaginal pressure, then it, it, it habituates after, uh, after five minutes, it gets a little bit lower. But then if they, if they do the stimulation in a way that they see, say uh, feels uh, pleasurable, usually rhythmical stimulation, then we get a, a, over a 60% increase. And, uh, uh, that increases after five minutes, uh, uh, and when uh, four of the ten women in the study uh, experienced orgasms as a result of the self-stimulation, and their thresholds went up over 100%. In other words, it took twice as much force before they said it hurts. But their touch thresholds didn't change at all. So we concluded that they're actually we're actually getting an, uh, an analgesia in the women. Um, so another question is, uh, what was, uh, what, which nerves carry this pain-blocking signal? And this is a, a, a schema of the different nerves of the, the hypogastric, well, the, the pudendal nerve carries sensation from the clitoris, which incidentally uh, has been described as having the, the most dense uh, sensory uh, nerve endings of any organ in the body in, in men or women. Uh, that's the pudendal nerve. And then the pelvic nerve carries sensation from the vagina and the cervix, and the uh, hypogastric nerve carries sensation from the cervix and the uterus. So those are the, uh, the main sensory nerves. Uh, this is a diagram of, the, of those sensory fields, of uh, the pudendal pelvic and hypogastric nerves. And this is a, a diagram of where those nerves enter the spinal cord. Uh, the the uh, pudendal and pelvic nerve enters at the lower at the lower sacral region, and the hypogastric at the uh, uh, middle uh, uh, thoracic region, uh, 10, 10, 11, and 12. So uh, I did I, I did a, a study. The question is which nerves carry the pain blocking signal. So I looked at women who have complete spinal cord injury, a complete transection of the spinal cord, that would block the uh, the pudendal and pelvic nerves. Uh, input, but not block the hypogastric nerve. And then as the control, which I thought would block all responses, uh, 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 lesions higher up. So, so this is, uh, so one group had a complete spinal cord transection at this level. Uh, I assumed that, uh, that they, could, they could get some pain blocking uh, input via the hypogastric nerve. And then the control group, which I thought uh, of, that's above a complete transaction above the level of all the known sensory nerves, that should block the effect of vaginal stimulation completely. Uh, to get, at, at least to get an idea of what the relative role of hypogastric versus the pelvic pudendal. Uh, so, uh, a surprise. <clears throat> when we did the study, <clears throat> we replicated the effect uh, that we got before, about over a 60% increase um, <clears throat> in the uh, non-injured women in the pain threshold, uh, but um, and we got I uh, got some uh, uh, significant analgesia uh, in the uh, in the group that uh, uh, blocked the uh, pelvic and pudendal nerves, but allowed the hypogastric nerve ent entry to the brain. That was okay too. But this was a big surprise because this was a group that I thought would, have, would be blocked completely, and in fact they had a bigger uh, uh, analgesic response than any of the others. Uh, this was really a, a, a very, very uh, puzzling to me, and, uh, and uh, I figured uh, either something's wrong or uh, there's some other, there's gotta be some alternative pathway uh, to get to the brain. Uh, 
Uh, and there was one study that had been done in rats uh, where they gave a tracer injected into the uterus, and they found that the vagus nerve was labeled by the, uh, by the tracer. Uh, oh, I should add uh, that um, not, only, not only did the women uh, have a, the, the greatest uh, analgesic response, but they also said that they, they feel, um, this is the high group, they, 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 they could feel um, the, um, uh, the, the vaginal, they could feel the vaginal stimulation or the cervical stimulation, they could, they could get uh, some threshold uh, of it, and they, they also felt men menstrual cramps. So not, they, the, the women said that they, uh, th it was pernicious because they had no sensation below, below the level of the uh, belly, belly button, the umbilicus, uh, no, no voluntary movement, no sensation. The only thing that they had left was menstrual cramps. Uh, but that was also evidence that there was, uh, uh, that it really is a, uh, a, a true phenomenon. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, I figured that uh, the only possible alternative route would be the vagus nerves. Uh, and the, uh, the vagus nerve, uh, this is a, a cranial nerve that uh, carries sensation, it's a motor and sensory nerve, from all of the major visceral organs, the heart, the, the stomach, the liver, uh, the, the, uh, the lungs, uh, the kidney, uh, the, the intestines, but it doesn't go as far as the, uh, as the pelvic region, classically. It stops, it stops in, the, um, in the abdominal and, and chest thoracic region. <clears throat> uh, but you see, it's, here's the spinal cord, and the, the vagus nerve is a, is a cranial nerve. It's a tenth cranial nerve, and it just goes down the neck, comes out of the brain, goes down the neck, through the, through the chest, and through the diaphragm, and into the abdomen. But then there was this one study in rats that uh, said that it may also go to the pelvic region. Uh, which is the genital region. You see, the, uh, this is a separate, separate uh, uh, set of uh, nerves in the pelvic region, uh, in, in, uh, at least in men, as shown here. Uh, so, um, they, I did a, a series of uh, studies in, in rats uh, to see whether uh, there's any evidence of the vagus nerve carrying sensation from the vagina and found that uh, indeed there is. And w w with the pain blocking uh, 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 paradigm, uh, this, is, this is what I hypothesized in women, that here is the, the, the normal pain pathway. If you apply a, a pressure to the finger, it goes uh, to the spinal cord and then up to the brain. Uh, if they apply vaginal or cervical self-stimulation by the pelvic and hypogastric nerves, uh, it, uh, it would go up to the brain. There's a descending uh, pathway that we demonstrated in, in rats uh, that uh, blocks pain at the level uh, of the spinal cord. Where the, where the sensory nerve uh, enters. So there's a, there's a, a, and others have shown this also, there's a descending, descending inhibitory pathways by norepinephrine and serotonin uh, that also uh, utilizes uh, endorphins in the spinal cord. I'm not gonna get into that, but there is this descending uh, system. Uh, and I figured that in the, in the case of the women who have a complete spinal cord injury, the transection of the spinal cord, that blocks the inputs uh, and this is just so I'm showing unilaterally, because everything is, is a bilateral system, uh, that the, uh, so the, the, vaginal, the vaginal stimulation, if it stimulates the vagus nerve, it would have to stimulate the, its uh, sensory nucleus, uh, which is the solitary nucleus, that's where the vagus nerve projects, and then send a descending pathway that would block the, the pain input to account for the, the, what we found. So, uh, how do, you, I get, how do you look at whether the solitary nucleus is activated? The only way would be by brain imaging, and that's, that's why I got into brain imaging, uh, to answer that question. And uh, so the, the, uh, what I found was that in five women who have a complete uh, cut of the spinal cord at the high level, that the region of the nu this, this nucleus of the solitary tract was activated in, in, all, in all the women uh, even though they have no pathway through the spinal cord, uh, but this is evidence that the vagus nerve is carrying the sensation from the vaginal and the cervical uh, uh, stimulation. And three of these women have orgasms. Uh, so, um, of the three women who had orgasms, this is the first time that we saw uh, any evidence in the brain of where orgasm is occurring. Uh, so I thought that's, that's kind of neat, and let's, uh, let's look at that some more. So uh, also I have to add the, um, uh, the, the, um, 
vagus nerve now as carrying sensation from the surface of the uterus and probably from the vagina as well, but that's not so clear. Um, and one, of the, one very interesting thing is that this is a very unique uh, finding, that, that the, the cervix evidently has innovation, sense, it, it's uh, sensation uh, via three different nerves, three different pairs of nerves, the pelvic, the hypogastric, and the vagus nerve. And uh, I've asked my colleagues that there's no other organ in the body that receives uh, innovation, sensory innovation, from three different pairs of nerves. So uh, the fact that the cervix does means that it must be done, doing something important. Uh, so, you know, finding that uh, the, the cervix and the vagina have, have uh, clearly sensory activity, and plus the fact that the, the women couldn't feel the clitoris, because that's, that's, a, that's the pudental nerve, and that's, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, only, the, the vagus nerve only goes to the internal organs. It doesn't go to the external organs. So, uh, I was convinced that there's vaginal and cervical sensation by the vagus nerve. But then, um, uh, the, the, uh, it, this went against the, uh, the dogma that was set up by Kinsey in their famous book on uh, uh, the, uh, the, human, uh, the, the uh, sexual response in the human female. And they said that in view of the evidence that the walls of the vagina are nor normally insensitive, and wall, they say all the clinical and experimental evidence show that the surface of the cervix is the most completely insensitive part of the female genital anatomy. Now, this was kind of peculiar because in the very same book, they did an experiment, uh, uh, and I'll show Lowell for this. They did the experiment where they, they, uh, they tested uh, this between 500 and 800, more than 800 women, uh, testing their uh, uh, sensitivity to tactile stimulation with a, uh, a, a cotton tip probe uh, or a gentle stimulation with glass or metal probe, uh, tactile stimulation on the vagina anterior, posterior, right, and left wall, and the cervix. And then they apply pressure uh, by, they say, uh, 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 with an object larger than a probe. Uh, small, uh, presumably smaller than, smaller than a bread box. But uh, uh, <laughs> so here, here's a close-up of, of, of the same data. And this is when they apply pressure to the vagina, anterior, posterior wall, or the cervix. This is uh, between 84 and 93 percent of, of over 800 women showed responses. So they, they're contradicting their own, their own findings. So, and somehow the, the idea that the vagina and cervix are insensate got into the, uh, into the popular literature. And uh, thanks to their, what, what, what uh, Kinsey said in their own book. Uh, so um, this was kind of puzzling. And then uh, we found some other evidence that uh, uh, here uh, this, in this uh, uh, Diagram of, um, uh, of of intercourse. Uh, they uh, Cutler asked the uh, the women how many how many felt that these different parts of the body contributed to their orgasm. Stimulation of, of different parts could they feel it as contributing to their orgasm? And 35 percent of the women said that uh, they could, that the cervix stimulation uh, 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 <coughs> contributed to their orgasm and. Two thirds of the women, women almost said that, that the vagina did. So um, this was not surprising about the clitoris, but uh, uh, clearly uh, women are describing that they that that the vagina and cervix are, are definitely sensitive. Uh, I just want to go some some recent uh, evidence is very uh, very interesting because it uh, it really broadens the concept of the of the clitoris. This is the glands clitoris. This is the uh, uh, the part that's visible. But uh, as recent evidence is showing, that the clitoris is actually much larger, and it, uh, the the uh, the legs of the clitoris uh, extend. Uh, the, the whole clitoris is shaped like a wishbone, and the the, the legs of the clitoris uh, 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 straddle the, the vaginal opening, the vaginal canal. And uh, this is a uh, uh, a sonogram uh, by uh, Wisson and others showing that this is uh, during intercourse. See, here's the, the corpus callosum. This is the penis, uh, not the uh, corpus cavernosum. This is, this is the, um, uh, the, the penis, and this is the, here are the clitoral bulbs uh, coming down 
straddling the vaginal wall. So it shows that the, the, that the clitoris can actually be stimulated mechanically uh, through, the, through the vaginal wall by the distension and the vibration, the movement, uh, even without uh, stimulating the internal clitoris. But the, the, uh, the in, I mean the external clitoris. The, the internal clitoris can be stimulated mechanically uh, during, during intercourse. Uh, this is new, new evidence recently published a couple of years ago. Uh, in addition to that, the women uh, descriptions that women give to uh, the uh, stimulation of the different regions uh, is, has, is, is different. Uh, this is in the literature that women describe uh, uh, the clitoral or perigenital skin as uh, giving a localized orgasm, uh, whereas if, if the uh, uh, vagina is uh, stimulated, they describe it as, as being more internal, deep, and even, and uh, with stimulation of both uh, the external and the, and the uh, vaginal, the external clitoris and, and the vaginal stimulation, uh, they, they describe it as, as a mixed orgasm, and if the uh, cervix and uterus uh, are stimulated, uh, one of the descriptions was a shower of stars when the cervix is stimulated, and when, when all regions are stimulated together, uh, jointly during uh, during intercourse, uh, the women describe those as the most intense and, and most complex, the most pleasurable. So uh, it's not just one over another, but each of these regions can individually contribute to uh, a sense of orgasm. Um, so they couldn't the, the women with the spinal cord injury could they couldn't feel clitoral stimulation, but they could feel vaginal and cervical stimulation by the the, uh, the vagus nerves. Uh, and, and so vaginal and cervical sensation is different from and it's independent of clitoral sensation. So there seems to be a lot of, a lot of interest in this in, in, in the popular literature and in the news. And uh, so this is basically uh, the, the current state of, uh, of our understanding. Uh, so we want, I wanted to say where, so where does, the, where does the activity go into the brain and how does it get uh, to orgasm? What parts of the, what, what is uh, specific about Orgasm. Um, so this is the um, uh, uh, this is the uh, sensory and motor cortex. Uh, this was this first uh, defined by uh, uh, Penfield. Uh, this this uh, strip that uh, strip of tissue that uh, goes uh, like if you wear earmuffs, the, the band of tissue that goes over the top of the head. That's where the sensory cortex is. And what Penfield Penfield was a, a neurosurgeon in the 1950s in, in uh, Yale. Montreal, uh, and uh, uh, this is this is the uh, the figure uh, um, we go back to that. This is uh, Penfield. What he did uh, was he mapped this this region of the sensory cortex. Uh, he was preparing the uh, patients for uh, surgery for epilepsy to remove a tumor, and uh, he exposed the skull. He under local anesthesia, with, with patients awake, he uh, cut through the skin. Uh, the scalp, and then uh, cut through the bone, lifted the bone off, and exposed the uh, the brain. And with a handheld electrode, he stimulated different parts of the of this court of the of this region, of the postcentral and precentral gyri. Um, and the when he so when he stimulated uh, this part of the, of, of the postcentral gyrus, the person said he feels like his hand is being stimulated. Uh, so, so it feels like somebody's touching his hand. And then when Penfield moved down here. Uh, and stimulated this region, uh, the person said, I feel like my face is being, somebody's touching my face. And so Penfield mapped the body on this uh, strip of sensory cortex. And there's a systematic uh, uh, localization of the face, the lips, the, the hand, uh, the trunk, uh, the, the legs, and the foot. And the genitals right down here. He didn't do it in women, he just did it in men. Uh, so uh, I thought that, uh, you know, let's take a look at, since it's never been done in women, we want to look and see what happens in, in women. Um, so, uh, first using uh, functional MRI, uh, we, we mapped, uh, here, well here, here is the, uh, I had shown you the, uh, this, uh, this, this region is where the, the feet and the genitals are, are represented. So, um, uh, this, so, so from this line, here, this is the uh, uh, the medial part of the of the uh, uh, sensory cortex. So this part, this is this is the region that corresponds to it in the in the cortex. 
And you can see that when, when we stimulated the, the, uh, the, the subject's finger, we got activation in, in, very, in where Penfield had uh, mapped the, uh, the finger area. And uh, if, we touch the, if I touch the face of the subject, then it activated a, a, a close region, uh, but it's a different lobule. You can see that the, this, the one that active, where the finger activates a different lobule from the one that the, uh, that the face activates. And, um, and also, if, uh, uh, if I stimulated the big toe for Alex, uh, then it activated the region of the, uh, uh, the, the medial cortex, where the, where the foot is supposed to be. So we're getting, uh, we've got good uh, 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 consistency with, with Penfield's map. And then we mapped the uh, clitoris, vagina, and cervix, and found that they all activated the, the, the middle region uh, close to the area of the uh, where the where the uh, foot is located, and similar to uh, to the uh, region activated in uh, in head. And uh, I'll come back to this. This was an unexpected finding that the nipple stimulation, nipple cell stimulation, activated the same region as the genital region. And uh, uh, but this this doesn't cons this is inconsistent with the fact that, that here's the chest area. So we expected that the the uh, nipple stimulation should activate the, the cortex out here instead of uh, in the medial region. But I'll come back to that. So, uh, and, and this, uh, this shows that when the, uh, this is the people using a hand to, for the self-stimulation, uh, so you can ignore this, but this is, this is where the three, the three different regions were activated by, and this is group data, uh, 11 women, uh, with uh, clitoral stimulation, cervical stimulation, and vaginal stimulation, these are all self-stimulation, um, that they all cluster in the same uh, region, the genital sensory cortex region, similar to men, uh, but they're each different, and they overlap. So uh, it's consistent with the fact that the different nerves carry sensation from the clitoris, vagina, and cervix, uh, and they each project to different regions of the cortex. Uh, here, the, here again are the different nerves, uh, the, the pudendal nerve for the clitoris and the, the pelvic uh, for the giant and the, uh, uh, also the, the pelvic nerve for the cervix. Uh, so I, I think this clearly uh, refutes uh, what uh, Kinsey came to the conclusion that women have no, no sensation for the vagina and the cervix. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it could uh, uh, also help to explain why women say that uh, the response of all the, all the regions is more, more intense and more complex because uh, by stimulating all the regions simultaneously or concurrently, uh, it's stimulating many more neurons in the brain. So by stimulating more neurons, there's more recruitment, there's more, uh, there's more activation of uh, more, uh, more uh, output from, the, from the, this initial uh, input region. Uh, and this was a big surprise that the nipple stimulation uh, also activates the genital sensory region. I showed you that before. Um, and um, we saw that very, very reliably. And this shows uh, just a close-up of, in, in three women, of the, the response to uh, genital self-stimulation. And the nipple stimulation is shown in white. And you can see the overlap with the genital uh, sensory cortex. And actually, we got some evidence of, of more lateral this is in the chest region, so that, that was consistent. But, but uh, the fact that the, uh, the nipple cell stimulation activated the uh, genital sensory cortex was a big surprise. It was a big surprise to me. And I asked my male colleagues, my male uh, neuroscientists, and I said, well, this, this, is, uh, this is really unexpected. We'll have to uh, change our consideration of specificity of the uh, Penfield map. And, uh, and then when I tell this to my women colleague, my women neuroscientist colleague, you say, yeah. <laughs> so um, there's a, a sex difference in the, uh, in, the in, in the interpretation of this. Uh, is surprising to some of us, but not to all of us. Um, the uh, I put this diagram in to show this is one of Meta's diagrams to show that uh, the um, there is functional convergence normally between the uh, nipple input and the and the cervical input because um, they both produce both stimuli, nursing and uh, cervical stimulation during childbirth and also during mating, during intercourse, uh, they both 
release oxytocin from the hypothalamus. The oxytocin is a hormone that's produced in the uh, in hypothalamic neurons. Uh, it's uh, believed that these neurons produce this peptide that travels down the axons, gets stored in terminals here, and when nursing stimulation occurs or when the baby is being born or during sexual intercourse, uh, the oxytocin, the action potentials, activate these neurons and it releases oxytocin into the blood. And the effect of the oxytocin released into the blood is in the case uh, in, in, in childbirth, the baby is pushing its head against the cervix and that activates this reflex activation of the oxytocin and that when the oxytocin gets into the blood, there are oxytocin receptors on the smooth muscle of the uterus and that causes contraction of the uterus uh, so that the bumping of the head of the fetus uh, at, on the cervix stimulates oxytocin that stimulates uterine contractions, pushes the head more forcefully against the cervix, gets more oxytocin released. It's one of the rare positive feedback mechanisms uh, in physiology. Uh, and it gets stronger and stronger until the baby is born and then the stimulus is gone. Uh, alternatively, uh, if the labor goes very prolonged, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, neurons can run out of oxytocin and then artificial oxytocin is given. Ketocin is, is administered in, in childbirth if the labor is, is very prolonged. Because these are peptides, they're synthesized in the cell bodies, and it takes hours for them to get from the cell body down to the terminals. So the women can really run out of oxytocin if, the, if there's enough uh, prolonged uh, stimulation. Then when the baby is born, the supplement stimulation stimulates the very same neurons to release oxytocin, the oxytocin that gets into the bloodstream stimulates uh, their, their smooth muscles that are called myoepithelial cells that surround the milk glands uh, in the mammary gland, and uh, it, the, uh, the oxytocin causes the contraction of these smooth muscles and it forcibly ejects the milk into the baby's mouth. Um, so this is, a, uh, 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 this is the, the milk ejection reflex. It's an oxytocin-mediated reflex. And actually, uh, the oxytocin that's released when the baby nurses stimulates uterine contractions. Women uh, describe uterine contractions when they're nursing. And also, women who are lactating uh, before, before they give birth, uh, when they're giving birth, they, they uh, often uh, report that they, they inject milk during the, uh, during the uterine contractions. So uh, this is, so it's not surprising, I mean, so we know that, that the uh, nipple and the cervical stimulation converge on the oxytocin neurons in the hypothalamus, but we're also seeing that it, apparently they converge in the uh, sensory cortex. Uh, <clears throat> um, now there's another, oh, I'm running out of time. Um, I think um, I better go, I'm gonna skip this part, uh, this persistent genital arousal disorder, um, and <clears throat> just go to, <coughs> excuse me, go to um, orgasm. Uh, so now we've been studying orgasm in, uh, in non-injured women, in, in uh, uh, intact women, able-bodied women, and uh, when we start, when they start the uh, genital stimulation, these are some serial sections through the brain. Uh, there's very little activation during the first minute of, of um, this is uh, clitoral self-stimulation, but at orgasm, there's uh, <clears throat> this strong activation throughout the brain. That's that's. <coughs> That's one of the things that we see very characteristically. A very, basically, all the, all the major brain systems are activated at orgasm. Uh, here's another example of, of several, picking several regions that are not activated, singular cortex, accumbens, amygdala, basal ganglia, insular hippocampus, and paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. <coughs> Inactive during the first, uh, here, here's a case of, <coughs> is <coughs> cervical cell stimulation, uh, <coughs> very little activation, uh, no activation in these regions, and then as orgasm develops, there's uh, increasing activation until they're all activated at orgasm. Uh, then using a very selective, uh, high, very, very high threshold, just picking uh, some regions that are particularly strongly activated. One of them is the nucleus accumbens, and that's a very interesting because that's considered to be the reward area of the brain. This is where dopamine projects, and this is activated, <clears throat> this region is activated not only during orgasm, but is activated during cocaine administration, and chocolate, and caffeine, and nicotine 
it's a, uh, a, it's a rewarding, this is a, an area that is typically activated by uh, stimuli that, that uh, people consider to be rewarding. <coughs> the the uh, ventral tegmentum is also activated. Uh, here, with, this is the genital, the, the genital sensory cortex, the paracentral lobule. Uh, this, this, uh, the, the ventral tegmentum is interesting because this is where the dopamine uh, neurons originate and they project to the nucleus accumbens. So this is the uh, this is the dopamine pathway, and there's a lot of evidence that dopamine is, is released during orgasm. That uh, drugs that stimulate dopamine intensify orgasms, and drugs like anti anti uh, psychotics um, that inhibit dopamine receptors block the uh, block orgasm. So dopamine seems to have a very important role. Uh, this is a case. Of <clears throat> this is where. Uh, Oxytocin secretion in uh, women and in men at orgasm. We see a different pattern, but there's a, a peak in women at orgasm. And we see that the, uh, the paraventricular neurons, the ones that secrete oxytocin, they become uh, activated uh, during, uh, during orgasm. Uh, the insula is at, uh, the insula is, is very reliably activated. This is, this is the insula. Uh, it's between the temporal lobe and the rest of the cortex, this uh, deeper part of the island. Um, and <clears throat> also the anterior cingulate cortex is activated. Uh, here's the inter anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, the, the thing that's interesting about this is that these two regions, anterior cingulate cortex and insula, they're activated not only during orgasm, but activated during, they're classically activated during pain. And um, uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I wonder what the connection is between uh, orgasm and pain. You see that pain is blocked. Uh, these two re regions are activated during both conditions. Uh, these are pictures of people during orgasm. Uh, so the, uh, there's a, a pain expression. So maybe the insula and the, and the cingulate cortex are, are involved in the expression of pain, but not the, not the experience of pain. Maybe just the motor expression. Uh, also, the uh, amygdala, uh, considered to be an emotional part of the brain, is the, uh, the amygdala. And also, the frontal cortex are strongly activated. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but what, what I'm emphasizing here is that different parts, of, different parts of the brain, this is the sequence of activation. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, y-axis uh, is a, a representation of the activation of different groups of, no of, different groups of neurons. Uh, orgasm occurs in the, in, the blue, mid, in the blue line. This is two minutes before and two minutes after in, in uh, 11 women. And uh, the, the point here is that different, there are different patterns, different temporal patterns. Some brain regions become activated at the, uh, immediately upon orgasm. Others become activated more gradually and others become activated later. So we're looking at the sequence of, um, uh, of, of, the, uh, of these patterns to see what, uh, what is the sequence going from the genital sensory cortex to the to eventual to orgasm. And this is a, a general scheme that we're seeing that first the general, genital sensory cortex get activated, then the limbic system, the amygdala and the campus, then the frontal cortex and cerebellum, um, and then uh, later at, at orgasm, the hypothalamus and nucleus accumbens get activated. But we're looking, we're doing a, a more uh, careful analysis uh, actually, it was uh, uh, developing a collaboration with uh, Reinhard Lappenbacher uh, for to do to do this kind of sequential analysis because it's similar to uh, uh, genetic analysis in, in, in uh, looking at many at an array of voxels, uh, an array of, of uh, regions of the brain, similar to uh, genetic. Display. So um, what what, uh, what what this is showing? This is an overall summary. This is one, one, one woman's orgasm, one of my graduate students. Um, and um, uh, this is, uh, there are 80 columns that are dividing into 80 uh, uh, conventional brain regions, <coughs> the bottom areas. And um, each row is a two second uh, representation of activity. And uh, the, the time is five minutes going from the top down to the bottom. And uh, the, um, uh, so each, and, and the colors are a hot metal analog. So the, the dark, dark red is the coolest, and the uh, white hot is the, is the uh, hottest. So you can see that uh, different regions become activated at different sequences. This is the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain. 
there's different sequences of activation, and but there's a general activation at orgasm, an overall activation throughout the brain, and then it cools down uh, after after uh, after orgasm. And um, I did a uh, an animation uh, a representation of this. Uh, let me see. At the <coughs> Fingers, 
uh, and uh, got strong activation of the sensory cortex, and then uh, asked her to distract, to, to looking at the brain, uh, try to try to get rid of that activity, and uh, then uh, she got rid of it. And this is the visual cortex. I said, um, Eleni, what are you doing? And she said, I was uh, I was uh, calculating my uh, paycheck. Uh, with, my, with my eyes closed, so I was uh, imagining doing the, the multiplication. Uh, so, so the visual cortex got activated, which wasn't activated before, but the pain was gone. She didn't feel the pain. And I said, I can't believe it. So we tried it again. Uh, I got activation, put the clamp on the finger again, got the activation. And then um, uh, she did the same thing. She got rid of the activation, and she was uh, doing the visual uh, uh, imaging again. So, um, we're seeing lots of surprises. Uh, I, I wrote a lot of this in our two books, uh, that, um, The Science of Orgasm and the Orgasm Answer Guide. This is for a more, uh, um, uh, less, uh, a more lay audience. Um, so uh, I think that's it. So um, lots of surprises, and we have a lot of work that we're continuing to do. So thank you. some reports that uh, they clinically report the same phenomena as orgasm, like clinically. I wanted to see, is it the same as what you mentioned in the, I mean, uh, uh, is it the same as the, what you mentioned in the last part of the list, the last part of? I, I, I don't know, but, but the, 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 women, can, women can definitely, we, we uh, I was very skeptical about it, and we, we studied their heart rate, blood pressure, pain thresholds, and pupil diameter. Um, and uh, in women who said that they can think themselves to orgasm. And, uh, and, and I, had, I, I measured their, these autonomic responses um, the quant quantitatively and also when they, when they uh, did physical self-stimulation and when they were, um, had the thought or orgasm. And the responses were, were compar comparable in magnitude. So I'm convinced. They said that they had orgasms and apparently a lot of women can do this. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know about how, how well documented those uh, cases of alien intercourse are, but, uh, you, know, um, you know, who knows if they're applying self-stimulation or, or what, uh, or if they're whatever it is. But, I mean, certainly, um, I, think, I think I'm convinced that women can uh, experience orgasms just by, by thinking. They have very different fantasies, uh, not all erotic. Some are... Um, uh, very pleasant, pleasurable, like walking along the uh, the seashore on a warm afternoon, and others are uh, uh, more abstract. Or they they think of the of energy coursing through the chakras, um, you know, whatever their whatever their fantasy is, you know, they're not necessarily um, erotic, and they're not necessarily visual. They could be uh, some you know whispering sweet nothing, like you know they thought of their lover with whispering sweet nothings in their ear, or um, you know all kinds of different. Uh, so, without any physical stimulation. <coughs> have a question. All, all that you presented is very centered on women's orgasms. Yeah. Are there studies of male orgasms? Yes. Uh, we're doing that now. We are studying uh, uh, orgasms in men and men after prostatectomy. Uh, what, what happens uh, uh, if so, some men have. Some men uh, lose the ability to have uh, erections, but they have orgasms, and others uh, lose, uh, keep the ability to have uh, erections, but they lose the orgasm. Uh, this is after prostatectomy, and uh, I'm interested in the pathways and also the, the responses. We are looking, we have looked at, at um, uh, orgasms in, in uh, able-bodied men, and uh, basically it's the same regions. The, the, uh, the similarities are far more, uh, are greater than any, any differences that we see. Uh, maybe we don't see uh, activation of the uh, paraventricular nucleus and the hypothalamus in men, but we're still looking at that. But all the other regions, all the regions I mentioned in women, they're all activated in men. And this is, uh, there's another group in, uh, uh, in Holland, uh, Holsteg and Georgiatis, and uh, they study men and women, 
Uh, also, they see they see uh, areas very similar to ours, uh, but uh, and and again, uh, the, the men and women <coughs> orgasms are very similar. There are some men who have sent me emails saying that they can they can think themselves into orgasm. Yeah, and they want to be subjects. Okay. And I haven't gotten around to it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, uh, the second one is if you could say, if you feel like you have the time, just say a little bit about the persistent genital arousal disorder that you didn't have time to oh, talk about. Oh, I'm glad you asked me that question. Good. I, I have a slide in my pocket. Okay. I, um, well, I, I, do we have a couple minutes? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, this, this was very surprising because this is a persistent genital arousal disorder. Um, the, um, this is a uh, condition that Sandra Liebland described in, in 2001. She characterized it in, in a publication. <clears throat> and then she followed it up. And she asked, um, it, it's persistent genital arousal disorder. It, it's it's, it's uh, intense genital stimulation, very disturbing, it's unwelcome, and lasts for a very long time. Uh, the, either women can't have orgasms, or if they have them, they, they, uh, they, they uh, don't get any satisfaction. Uh, the orgasms make them feel worse, they're tormenting. Some of the women try suicide, and the cause was not known, and there was, there's no effective treatment. Uh, all kinds of pain blockers and anti-epileptics and anti-psychotics and, and antidepressants, everything, everything under the sun has been tried, nothing works effectively. And, um, so uh, Sandra asked me, she was at Rutgers, uh, she died a couple of years ago of uh, a brain, uh, brain tumor. Um, and uh, she, uh, so she asked me to look at the brain activity, and uh, when I looked at these women, there's a strong, very abnormally strong activation of the genital sensory cortex. So that, there's some genital sensory activity going on in the brain. Uh, so that's how I got into the area, and then people uh, got to know this, they have to know about this. And um, I got a phone call a couple of years ago from a, a MD who said his wife has PDF, which is a general arousal disorder, and she also has a tarlow cyst. And uh, I didn't know what a tarlow cyst is, uh, so I did some literature search, and it turns out that um, uh, they occur on the genital sensory nerves, uh, and they, they produce gen uh, abnormal sensations. Um, so I, I asked women to send me uh, MRIs of the lower back. And uh, in the literature, it says that uh, in more than 5,000 cases in the literature, people who go in uh, for lower back problems and have MRIs, the, um, the incidence of uh, these carbocysts is between 1 and 9 percent. And I asked of uh, 18 women who I, I, I asked, this is a, a support group, an uh, internet support group of over 300 women. I got 18 MRIs of, of this lower back region. And 12 of them had one or more tarlow cysts, so it's much higher than the uh, than the general population. Uh, the uh, this is the, dors the dorsal root ganglion is where the sensory nerves. That's uh, just a scheme of, the, of that. This is where the, the dorsal root ganglion is. This is where um, the tarlow cysts form over here. This is a diagram from Tarlow's original book in uh, 1930 that. Um, it, it form, it's a cyst that forms, it's, it's a cerebrospinal fluid that forms at the dorsal root ganglion, uh, and it's filled with the, with the CSF, and there are fibers, there are ab aberrant sensory fibers in, in the cyst and in the wall, and, uh, and, and, this, and the, the, this region is right where the, where the dorsal root ganglion enter the, uh, the, the, the vertebra, so there's a lot of, there's a, a potential for friction uh, and you know mechanical stimulation of the uh, of the of the cyst. This is a, some pictures of the of tarlow cysts. They show up very uh, bright in uh, these T2 weighted uh, MRIs, and they typically form on S2 and S3. And S2 and S3, sacral two and three. And here's another uh, couple of other images of the cysts. Very easy to see them. Um, S2 and S3. This is uh, the the map, a uh, sensory map. So uh, S2 is the uh, the clitoris and s3 is the, is the uh, vaginal opening and this is where the women typically say they have the uh, the symptoms uh, some of the treatments that have been done have been used that are that are totally ineffective they it is a, a pudental nerve block which is done right at the peri periphery 
And this doesn't have any effect. It, it, makes the, it makes the periphery numb, but it doesn't alleviate the symptoms. And that's because the, the irritation is coming from the dorsal ganglion. So blocking the, the sensory nerve doesn't do any good. And in, in addition, um, clitoridectomy, uh, removal of the clitoris surgically has been tried, and that doesn't help either. So uh, it's, uh, uh, so it's a very nasty, uh, it's, it's difficult to do the surgery. There aren't surgeons who, who treat the cysts, and uh, that's what I'm, uh, the, the, my next step, this, I just identified, I just published this, uh, the next step is to uh, give a local anesthesia to the cyst and see if it alleviates the symptoms for the duration, for the duration of the anesthesia and come back. That'll, that'll demonstrate that, that, that that's where it's really uh, coming from. Uh, and then, then uh, to do surgery. Barry's going to be here to tomorrow afternoon, and that, I think you still have two slots but, uh, remember, for lunch tomorrow, so that the two students who want to really learn more you can show off. Just want to tell Tunisia or remark. Let's thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you.